Cameron, okay. Praise the Lord, everybody. Why do you suppose that people think that you are strange for being in this faith? Why is that? I mean, we're here on the Sabbath day, amen? Most of the Christian world, is, they're, not holding Sabbath, they're not holding Sabbath services. They'll be having services tomorrow on Sunday. And why is that? You see, we think we're, we're considered, because you and I were Sabbath keepers and we keep the holy days of the Bible that are commanded to, to even be kept throughout even the new heavens and the new earth as we see in Isaiah chapter 66. We keep those. They've replaced the Sabbath with Sunday. They've replaced the Holy Day festivals with holidays that have pagan roots. But we're the ones that are weird. Amen? We're the strange ones. And why is that? How did it get to be this way? You know, we find what Jesus told the woman at the well in Samaria, in chapter 4 of John. You know, he told her, the Father is seeking true worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. And he said, God must be worshipped, must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. In Matthew chapter 15, G Jesus told the religious leaders, you nicely set aside the commandments of God to hold to your own traditions. And then he said, in vain do you worship me. Now they were worshiping God according to their traditions. Now a tradition is not wrong. Actually the Apostle Paul said to hold the traditions that you receive from us. But you don't replace a commandment with a with the tradition of man. And see, that's what's happening now. Why do people argue with you? Why, if, if people, why are they offended that you keep the Sabbath? Why are they offended that you don't participate in Christmas or Easter or Halloween or Valentine's Day and that you keep the holy days? Why is that? You see, and the simple reason is this. Their minds have been poisoned by false teachers. Our whole society is that way. Israel was that way. It was always that way. We're going to see in 2 Peter chapter 2 that there were always false teachers, false prophets among the children of God, among Israel, and there will be among you too. It always has been that way. It always will be that way. That's how Satan works. Who is the deceiver? Satan. Who is the liar? Who is the father of lies? Think about it. The father of lies. He get, I call lies the baby's devil. I mean, the, the, the devil's babies. You know? They're his lies. Now, he ha, he, there's a purpose for every lie. All of us have lied. The Bible says we're all liars. And when we have lied, there's a purpose. Usually it's to cover our rear end. And it's usually because we did something we shouldn't have done. And, we have, and, and we're embarrassed about it. And so... We make up some story, you know. Uh, I remember one time, I, I took one of the little neighbor kids fishing. And he, he had a tendency to tell tall tales. He was a little bitty guy named Mikey. And we were out uh, uh, by the dike road out there, across from Bonadilla. <laughs> and there's nothing there. There's water and there's these rocks. And then there's the highway up there, you know. And... Um, he said, Brother Larry? I said, yeah. And he said, I saw a monkey. <laughs> I said, you did? He said, yeah. I said, well, where was it? Right there on that rock? I said, where'd it go? I said, I don't know. I said, you know, Mikey, I, I don't think you really saw a monkey. He said, maybe it was a turtle. <laughs> well, you might have seen a turtle. There's lots of turtles out here on this lake, you know, so it's possible you saw a turtle. But he said, but I think it was a monkey. <laughs> You know, now he was a little boy that would request the song. Uh, 
the one we sing, may Christ be exalted in us. But he would say, Brother Larry, can we sing, may Christ be exhausted in us? <laughs> and I said, yeah, we'll, we'll sing that song. But think about, you know, every lie that the devil plants, he plants in order to replace a truth. Amen? Now, why would he do that? Because he wants to bring you into bondage. Isn't that right? I mean, that's what he does. He's a tyrant. He wants to bring us into bondage. What did Jesus say about the truth? He said, you will know the truth, and the truth will do what? The truth will set you free. The truth will do what the devil does not want, and that's for you to be free. Amen? And to me to be free. So if any kind of... Um, any kind of doctrine that brings us into a bondage, it comes from the devil because that's what he wants. Any kind of doctrine. And we may think, well, that doesn't really matter. That's not really a salvational issue. It's an issue. It's an issue. Jesus is the truth. Do you know when Jesus came, why did people follow Jesus? Why did all the crowds follow him? It's because of the miracles he did. I mean, he fed 5,000 men and all the women and the children that were there too. They didn't even count them. Thousands of people, probably 15,000 people maybe, you know, with what? Five loaves of bread and two small fish. People, you know, were amazed at that. And then they saw him heal so many people, deliver people, cast out demons, they heard about the other miracles. He walked on water. He, he spoke to the wind and made it silent. The waves and made the sea calm. He did all of those things. And they, they knew this was someone special. And they followed him. But by the time we get to the day of Pentecost, after over three and a half years, or about three and a half years of his ministry, how many people were there? There was only 120 people. 120 believers. Now, the religious leaders before that, were so concerned, you see, because they said all of Judea, indeed the whole world is going to follow this man if we don't do something. And so they conspired to falsely accuse him. You know what that is? That's lies. That's using lies against the one who said, I am the truth. Using lies against the truth. And people, listen, People will believe a lie before they'll believe the truth. It's just in human nature. And it seems like the bigger the lie, the more readily people will believe it. You know, people that engaged, engaged in national uh, propaganda, like Goebbels in Nazi Germany, he discovered that, that a lie has to be big enough if you tell a big enough lie, often enough, people will believe it and will be indoctrinated in it. And that's what they did. You know, they, they, they made up all these lies about the Jews because they, they wanted to purge their land of the, the Jews. And so they had all these lies about them. They said they were vampires. That they, they came up with the idea that they were subhuman. They used the concept of evolution. And they said, well, these are not really evolved. They, they, they were subhuman, they're not fully human, and they don't have a soul. That's what the Germans taught the people. Now, they had to say this over and over and over and over. And they had to get, they had to take the Jews and separate them from the people. You know why? Because almost all Germans knew Jews. And, almost, and they didn't have a natural hatred for the Jews. There were a lot of friends. Germans and Jews were friends. Intermarrying. There was all this going on in Germany for, you know, thousands of years, you know. So in order to make vilify the Jews, he had to separate them. You can't. They couldn't be reminded, well, that's just, that's just John Goldstein, you know. Or that's just, uh, you know, Anthony... Uh, Rommer or whatever it happens to be, you know, you can't, you couldn't do that. You had to separate them. And that's what the devil will always try to do. Separate you from the truth and separate you from people who love the truth.
also. Amen? So the, the devil has a reason. Why did, why did everybody follow Jesus? Because of the miracles. And because they knew he was someone. But why is it that when we get to the day of Pentecost, everybody had left? You had a 120 believers. That's it. Why? What happened between thousands, all of Judea, and even people coming from other lands, coming to, to meet this Jesus, Gentiles coming to, to meet this Jesus? What happened? And you know what happened? The religious leaders began to conspire against him. And they began to teach the people that he was a sorcerer. And that he was doing these miracles by the power of the devil. And that he was a false teacher. You see, Jesus healed. Listen, Jesus fed the 5,000. Listen, in John chapter 6, Jesus fed 5,000 5, men. And then on top of that, women and children with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they had baskets full left over. That's a miracle. Everybody saw it. Everybody ate until they were filled. God continued to multiply, you know, as they gave this food out. Everybody saw it. After that, you know what Jesus did? Same chapter. He walked on water. Not only did he walk on water, but he called Peter to come out and walk on water. An ordinary man. He says, as long as you keep your eyes on me, you can walk on water. These are the two things he did. In chapter 7, the very next chapter, after everybody witnessing all of this, they were saying, well, the people were divided because they said, I don't know. He seems like he's teaching false doctrine. So I just said in chapter 7. And they were afraid to say very much. The people that were thought, well, yeah, but if he's a false teacher, how could he do these great things? How could he do these great things? How could he perform these great miracles? Surely he couldn't cast out demons. Would the devil cast his own demons out? Come on. What's going on? Would the devil heal people? I mean, will he go to that length to try to deceive people? And, and what were they accusing Jesus? Uh, they were accusing him of the appearance of evil. By the way, that doesn't mean that in that scripture. If you look at it, it just means don't do evil. But people made a living off the appearance of evil type thing. If the appearance of evil was actually meaning that, you know, Jesus would be very guilty. He met a woman, a promiscuous woman at a well alone. And before, and he had planned to do it. And he met her in the certain time of day that he knew no one else would be out there. She would have to go out there during that time of day. And so he sent his disciples and other followers away to another city while he went alone which would have been considered not proper at all, not proper to meet a woman alone, and certainly not a promiscuous woman <laughs> that's living with someone she's not married to. But that's what Jesus did. And so when his disciples came, they're saying, what? what's going on here? You know, Why did they think that way? Because that's what they were taught. When they accused Jesus of being a sinner, why? Because... He ate with prostitutes and tax collectors. And they accused him of being a said, You're, If you were really a prophet, you wouldn't let that woman touch you. You let that woman touch you. Wash your feet. You let that woman put perfume on you. Simon the Pharisee adjusting his robe, you know, and his tassel swinging a little bit. You know, he said, well, this, if he was truly a prophet, he would, he'd know who this woman is and he would not even let her touch him. That's what they thought. Why did they think that? Because that's what they were taught, you see. So Jesus came doing some of the very things that they didn't believe. Listen, there was a man that was lame. And he, he was by the, the pool of Siloam. And every so often an angel would come in and stir that water up. And whoever would get into that pool would be healed. But he had no one to put him in the pool. And he would try to crawl over there. He couldn't get in there before someone else did. And no one helped him. And this went on year after year after year after year after year. Can you imagine how depressing, how that would weigh on you? And no one. And the healing is right there. It's just within reach. And every time, 
that stirs up, you miss the healing. You miss the miracle. You could walk out, you could walk out of that place, but no one helps you. Everyone just pushes you away and gets in themselves. All right, Jesus goes to that very man. He knows him. He knew him before the foundation of the earth. He planned that man's birth. He allowed that to happen for a time such as this. I want us to understand that Jesus knows. Some of those specific cases like that, Jesus knew ahead of time, just like he did with blind Bartimaeus. He said, the reason that you know, he's blind is not because of his sins or his parents' sins or anyone else. It's, because, it's for a time such as this. It's for the glory of God. It's, that's what it's for. And so Jesus came to that man. He found that man by the pool. It had been all these years. All these years crawling on his elbows. Crawling to try to get somewhere. No one to help him. The Bible says he had no one to help him. He had to just do it himself. Can you imagine that? And Jesus found that man. And he healed him. And he was ecstatic. He was, and he was praising God and giving God glory. And Jesus said, pick up your blanket. It's a blanket. Pick up your blanket. You, some of you got blankets here. <laughs> you know, pick up your blanket and go home. And he did. And the religious leaders... You know, and everybody's seeing this, and everybody's, do you see what Jesus told him to do? Jesus told him to pick that blanket up. Jesus told him to pick, carry that blanket home. It's the Sabbath day. He'd be breaking the Sabbath. He's transporting cargo. On, that's what they thought. He's transporting cargo on the Sabbath day. Jesus wasn't breaking the Sabbath day, and neither was the man. But they believed he was. Jesus was accused of breaking the Sabbath. The man was accused of breaking the Sabbath. Why? Because false teachers. Because people had taught them that. You see? And Jesus exposed them. He said, you know, you put heavy burdens on people. You put heavy burdens on people. You won't carry any, and you won't lift a finger to help anybody else. And then Paul said of them, and he said, you know, in, in Gal Galatians chapter 6, he said, those who want you or are trying to compel you to be circumcised and keep the whole law of Moses, they don't keep the law themselves. They don't even keep it. And they don't. And that's why he said in Matthew chapter 5, you nicely set aside the commandments of God for your own tradition. And what do we have today? Why do so many people resist the Sabbath? Because they are invested in the tradition of Sunday. That's why. They, they, have, they have an affection for it. But you know what the affection is really for? It's really for a lie. Is it the truth or not? Is Sunday the first day or the seventh day? It's the first day. Did God bless the first day or did he bless the seventh day? Did God write with his own finger in the tablets of stone, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? You shall do no work on this day. You shall have a holy convocation because in six days the Lord your God made all things and he rested on this day and he set it apart. Sanctify means set it apart for a holy purpose. He set it apart for a holy purpose, for a holy convocation between God's people and God himself, the creator God. But people resist it. Why do they resist it? It's because they've steeped in tradition. Why is the tradition there? Because of false teachers. That's exactly why. And that's why we'll see in Second Peter chapter 2 that Peter says, as there were always false prophets, false teachers among the people of God, there will be among you too. It's always going to be that. Jude said certain people have crept in, unaware. They're, and they're teaching licentiousness. You know, they're teaching error. They're teaching that you can relax things, you know, 
that God doesn't want you to wreck. So there's Jesus. This man, he heals. Uh, and now Jesus did it. Did it? Now, Jesus, do you think Jesus specifically planned to go there on the Sabbath to the pool of Siloam? I do too. Do you think he wanted to heal that man in front of everybody? Yeah, I do. Do you think Jesus meant to be controversial? Yeah. But should have Jesus been controversial? No. If they weren't taught lies and false traditions that, that were contrary to mercy and grace, you see, and love toward your fellow man, you know, th that would have been, they would have been happy. But they weren't happy. They see the man and he's walking. Now they know this man. They see him all the time. And he's been there for years. They've seen him crawling on his elbows, dragging himself there. They see that. I mean, think about it. I mean, he has to beg, you know, so he can eat. They see that. And they see this man fully healed and he's walking on both legs without a limp. And they can't rejoice. They can't be happy. They stop and they say, what are you breaking the Sabbath for? You're breaking the Sabbath. You, you're, you're, you know it's wrong to transport cargo on the Sabbath, and yet you've got your blanket in your hands. And the man says, well, <laughs> I mean, Jesus healed me with a word. And the one who healed me, I've been lame since I was a child. All these years, I haven't been able to walk. All these years, I've had to drag myself around. And Jesus comes and finds me and says, do you want to be healed? Well, I've been trying to get in the pool. No one helps me. Well, you don't need that pool. All you need is me. Pick up your blanket and go home. And he felt the strength come into his legs. He picked up his blanket and he went home. Well, he started home. And the religious leaders, you know what they saw? They, didn't, they saw someone violating a law. He wasn't. Why did they think that? Because that's what they had been taught. Who taught them that? People who weren't teaching the truth. The same ones that Peter was saying, false teachers have always been among the people of God. They've always said that. Now the devil knows that. You go out and mow your lawn on Sunday. And maybe you think in Christian C and say, well, you're not even, that, that bother you a little bit, doesn't it? I mean, sometimes I think about it. No, don't bother Linda. <laughs> but sometimes, you know, uh, you think, <clears throat> well, it looks like I'm desecrating the Lord's day. <laughs> it looks like I don't even care, you know, because that's the way the society is. Same way with like, you know, but with some other things like that. But that's because of the culture that we're in, you know. It's been... Um, poisoned you know it's always it's always been that way poisoned amen let's go over to second Peter chapter 2 but think about it everybody's following Jesus and by the time we get to Pentecost the end of his ministry there's 120 people because the religious leaders they concentrated on poisoning the people's mind about Jesus, saying that he was teaching falsehood. Here in 2 Peter chapter 2, notice verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you. You will, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, notice, 
the way of the truth will be maligned. Now that means evil spoken of. You know, if someone maligns you, it means they're speaking evil of you. Now listen, if you're going to follow the Lord, if you're going to follow the truth, if you're going to try to follow the Lord in truth and practice the truth and worship God in truth, the devil is going to target you and you're going to be lied about. It's never been any other way. It's been that way forever. You know, Paul told Timothy, everyone who will live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You know, you, you're going to have to be discredited. God does, I mean, the devil doesn't want anyone listening to you. You know, he'll discredit you somehow. And you'll wonder, well, how come people are, what, what, what's happening? Well, that's what's happening. Think about it. There's a war going on between the forces of darkness and the, the kingdom of light. There just is. We wrestle against those principalities. But they use lies and deception, see. False, you know, that's how, what they did with Jesus. They falsely accused him. They, they planted, these were religions that everybody respected. These were the mainstream. How many times have you heard a mainstream preacher, and they may be a very good preacher, and you can learn a lot from them. Nothing wrong with that. But how many times have you heard one, they, they, they preach about, they're really good, they can preach about a lot of different things, and you can learn a lot from them, but they get on the Sabbath of the holy days, they stumble all over the place, but they go all, they, they do everything they can in order to discredit the Sabbath or say, well, it doesn't matter, or it was changed to Sunday, or we keep Sunday because the early church did, and all of that is just not even true. It's just not even true. It's a lie. But why is it that they want to embrace the lie? They want to stay in that tradition, they're invested in it. And then there'll be other people that will say, well, my grandma was the most righteous person I ever heard, I ever saw. And she didn't keep the Sabbath. Are you telling me that she's in hell? No, not at all. But people will say things like that, you know. It doesn't mean that at all. Really, it's, you know, no, but we don't have all the truth by any stretch of the imagination. Now, we may have the Sabbath truth and, and know it and the holy days. But we don't have all the truth either. You know, God looks at us, do you love the truth? Do you love the truth? Do you want to worship God in spirit and in truth? Now, see, there's, there's a lot of groups, the Sabbath-keeping groups. They're heavy on truth, but they're scared to death of anything spiritual. They don't want to worship God. They don't want to lift their hands to God. They, they don't want to say hallelujah or amen or praise the Lord. They don't want to say, because that sounds too Protestant-y. If that's a word, that's probably not even a word. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I remember, um, well, I, I told your mama, Linda, because someone came from another church and visited our church, and she clapped her hands. Well, that's what they did in her church. Well, she wasn't even in our church. And then, of course, in that particular domination, people didn't clap their hands for services. Pitiful, in it? But that's the way it was. But anyway... Um, I went to visit your mom and bothered your mom, and I understand that because that's what Armstrong taught, you know. Is, and I, I said, listen, everything Protestants do is not wrong. I mean, it's just like everything pagans do is not wrong. The way they worship is wrong, but <laughs> the, everything they do is not wrong, you know, so we just don't lump it in like that. But now notice here it says, because... Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, because of who? Because of false teachers, the way, the way of truth will be maligned. In other words, the truth and practicing the truth will be evil spoken of. You know, you, I, I, rem, I was talking to a, a Baptist minister that uh, came and was visiting with me one day a couple weeks ago. And I told him, well, you know, I'm a Sabbath keeper, and, and uh, he's Baptist. And I said, well, I was raised free will Baptist. 
And he said, so you're a Sabbath keeper. You have services on Saturday. I said, yeah. And he said, uh, are you Jehovah Witness? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not Jehovah Witness. And Jehovah Witnesses don't keep the Sabbath. They keep Sunday. You're probably thinking of seven-day Adventists, you know. And uh, he said, yeah, maybe that's, that's what it was. But anyway, you know, he didn't really ask any other questions or anything like that. He wasn't really all that interested. I'm always ready to talk. I don't care what it's about, aren't y'all? I mean, I am. I'm ready to talk or discuss uh, teachings and things like that. You know, I'm interested. But a lot of times, they're not. They don't want to. And most of the time, it's because they really know they don't have a case. They can't make their case for their beliefs, you know. And sometimes I'll, you, you'll have them start, and then once you, you begin, and then they say, well, actually, you're going to use some scriptures, and you kind of know a little bit about why you do what you do. Well, then, well, let's talk about something else, you know. But every lie has a purpose. Every one of them. When they were lying about Jesus, it was ordered to discredit him, to get people to, you know, eventually what happened? The people cried out, crucify him. The very people that followed him, the very, some of the people probably that had even had been healed and witnessed miracles, cried out, and the Bible tells us who incited them. The chief priests, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. That's who incited the crowd. And we take the world, our culture out here, and the world out there, there's someone inciting them now against the truth. So when you stand in the truth, you're not going to look around and see a whole lot of people with you. It's never been that way. It's never been that way. And it will not be that way. You know, Jesus said there are few. Straight and narrow is the gate, and there's few who will find it. And he calls his, his church a little flock. So it says, but false prophets who, who also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Heresies are just false teachings. Destructive heresies. What are they destroying? They're destroying the foundation of truth so that everything else would fall. Even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves, many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned or evil spoken of and in their greed they will exploit you with false words their judgment so in their greed they will exploit you with false words their judgment from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep now let's go over to Jude a book right before the book of Revelation Jude is a brother of Jesus and it's interesting because we're going to read a scripture today where Jude with his other brothers are being very sarcastic toward Jesus. This is before they believed that he was, you know, uh, the Messiah. And they thought he was just like, they were just, well, why don't you just go up to the feast? Just show yourself. If you can really do these things, show everybody. So don't just do it in secret. Come on, do that. He said, I'm not going. They're just smart aleck brothers. Here in Jude chapter uh, 3, or it's, there's only one chapter, it's verse 3. It says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. Now, that's what Jude wanted to do. I, I mean, I, I understand this. I do understand this. And people say, well, how come, you, you know, you guys make too much of a deal out of the Holy Days and, and, and uh, the Sabbath. And it's, it's like, so, well, we don't want to. I mean, we don't really want to. I mean, that's just what the issues are. That's, 
That's where we need to come into agreement on. You know, that's why we talk about it. Same reason you talk about Sunday, we talk about the Sabbath. I mean, same reason you get all excited about Christmas coming up. Well, that's why we get excited about the Feast of Tabernacles or the Holy Days. Uh, it's, why can't we just come together and reason this out? But they won't. Why? Because they don't love the truth. That's the simple reason. They love the traditions of, their, of this world more than the truth of God. That's, that's the truth. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, the Apostle Paul said, before the day of the Lord, there's going to come a great falling away. And the Antichrist is going to be revealed. That man who's going to sit in the temple and speak out against God and claim to be God. That's what he said. And then he went on to say that there will be those who will not be saved because they will not receive a love of the truth. The reason you're here is because you love the truth. That's the reason. And the reason why other people are not is because they don't love the truth. And there's not anything that I can do about that. There's nothing you can do about that. You know, but the good news is, is one day, just like with us, we're going along and we don't have that. We're not convicted. We don't have that. God has not opened our mind. And God does open our mind one day. We find, hmm, I didn't know that. And I do really want the truth. I want the truth. I want to be set free. I want to worship God in spirit and in truth. Think about it. Jesus is the truth. How do you worship the truth in lies? You can't worship the truth in lies. He is the truth. The devil is the deceiver. Jesus is the truth. The devil is the father of lies. He is the deceiver. And it's just like the fruit in the garden or anything else he offers, it looks good on the outside. It appears good. It is desirable to the flesh. It's desirable to the senses. To this. I mean, think about it. You don't want to be persecuted. We sang the song, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Uh, talks about times before, and that's times before, but it happens now in some countries like the Myanmar Republic, even now in India and in some places, in the Islamic countries, you can't be a Christian. You know, I mean, you, you're going you're gonna to be killed. If you're, you know, there'll be groups like ISIS, radical Islamic groups that will think their duty is to, if you will not submit to Allah, then you should be killed. That's what they believe, you know. <clears throat> well, what if you're brought, but there are people that are, that are, you know, their faith in Christ is, comes to light. And when it comes to light, then they have to come before authorities. And when they come before authorities, they maybe come under the penalty even of death, you see. And that's, that happens every day in the world, you know. I mean, I don't know what it is now. I, I know several years ago, um, you know, there was about 200, there was believed to be about 200,000 martyrs every year that, that were killed for the cause of Christ. Now, they're going to stand there. Now, they, they're going to be offered, let's, you know, you can compromise. Just let go of Jesus and now... Who is Jesus? The truth. Let go of the truth. Come into the fold. Just receive this. That's all you have to do. Just let go of that truth. You know, it doesn't really matter. If you know truth and you just let go of it or you deny it, can you, can you deny 
truth without denying the truth in Christ. How? If the Father is seeking true worshipers, do you know what that means? That means they're worshipers who are not true. Why would Jesus say the Father wants true worshipers? And who are true worshipers? Those who will worship him in, in spirit and in truth. That means that there are those who are not true worshipers. Now, I'm not trying to judge someone. And you can't really judge somebody by Sunday or at Christmas or anything. You can judge that. You can judge the subject itself, but you can't judge a person because you don't know what they know. Amen? You know, I, I use the example of Brother Joseph, you know, our beloved pastor in, in uh, Kenya, uh, you know, who's been here a couple times, and I've been there. And um, we did crusades together, and he's like, you know, I mean, we're, you know, close until, you know, he recently died. But, um, you know, he was a faithful man. He loved the truth, but he didn't know about the Sabbath. He didn't know about the Holy Days. And there was a preacher from New York came over to Kenya who was a Sabbath keeper and a Holy Day keeper. And Joseph was a part of the Crusades there. And he, and he saw this guy actually... You know, he preached the gospel, but it got down to the specifics of the teaching, uh, you know, of coming for a holy convocation, all that, and he taught the Sabbath. Brother Joseph told me, he said, I went to him and I said, no, brother, uh, we're not, we don't, we're, we go to church on Sunday. And he said, well, are you open to studying the scriptures on it? He said, yeah. And it just opened his eyes, you know, and he received the truth. But he already loved the truth. He just didn't know the truth. He hadn't rejected it, you see. But how serious is it to reject or to neglect? You know about it, but you neglect. Is it any different than knowing someone is in need and neglecting to help them? I mean, the Bible's very strong about that. You see someone in need, you know, um, James talks about that, you know, talks about pure religion, taking care of the widows and the orphans and those who are in need. Can you really, can the love of God, John said, can the love of God really be manifested? Can it be working in you if you can walk by someone who is really, you know, is really in need? Uh, can you just turn them away, you know? You know, you're not thinking about how they got there because we all get there. <laughs> we all get where we shouldn't be. Amen? Isn't that right? I mean, we all get it. Get out. We may all get ourselves in a financial mess from time to time or whatever. You know, my early life, that's where I spent most of my time. <laughs> you know, in financial trouble, you know. But, uh, you know, uh, you never know. And you never know when, honestly, you come across someone, you may be entertaining an angel unaware. Amen? Maybe God planted that, that old guy looks like a derelict, you know, or whatever, you know? Maybe that's not really a man after all. Maybe it's an angel, just to test you, just to see. You know, will you have the Lord's compassion? You know, will you actually care about that person? Will you, will you be praying about someone? But, you know, we, to be the children of God and the children of light, we have to practice the truth. Amen. I'm just going to back up just one moment. We're going to go on there in Jude. But in 1 John chapter 1, it says, talking about having fellowship with God and with Jesus. And then, John said, this is a message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie. But how many people are doing that all the time? How many people are actually trying to worship God or are celebrating a holiday in the name of God 
in the name of Jesus Christ that is rooted in darkness. All the customs, everything about it is about, you know, the darkness of this world as far as like it's not in the, the light of God. But if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So if we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. The truth has to be in us. Will you let the truth in you? Now you've let the truth, you've let the Sabbath truth in you. You've let the truth of the holy days in you. You've discarded the lies and the darkness of the of the holidays that have pagan uh, roots in them. But you know, this is a process that goes on our entire life. We're going to, the Lord will continue to lead us into more and more truth. Amen? We'll see the need to grow in love. Amen? And mercy and grace and to rely more on the grace. When we think about the commandments of God and we love the commandments of God, but we have to remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 7, that though he loves them and is righteous, he finds that he violates them. He knows that he falls short. He, we have to know that. That is, as we strive, we're still going to fall short. That's a very important truth for us to understand so that we can then appreciate and pray for and receive the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because that's how, that's how we're saved. You know, we find in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that even the commandments of God, which we love, Jesus loves, Paul loves, we love, is still called the ministry of death, the ministry of condemnation, because we see it stands against us because we violated those commandments. Amen? So we have to have, the, there's nothing, there's nothing in the commandments which are righteous and true. There's nothing in there that can take away the violation. Amen? Nothing that can take it away. We have to have someone, it demands um, a penalty. The wages of sin is death. So either you're going to die or we're going to accept the death of a Savior. Amen? Who died for us. And we'll rejoice in that. And then we'll walk obediently before Him as best as we can, knowing that not being arrogant, not being prideful. I remember one time, you know, I'd bought some speakers, big speakers like these or like those up there, uh, on eBay from someone in Colorado. And I remembered that I'd met a Messianic minister there um, at a conference once in Oklahoma. And so I called uh, the people in Oklahoma and I said, what was this guy's name? They gave me his, his phone number. So I called him and I'm talking, I'm saying, listen, uh, I bought some speakers near you. Would you mind? I'll pay you if you'll just go pick them up and you'll ship them to me because they won't ship them. And he said, I'd be happy to do that. And I don't want any money for it. I just do it for a brother. Let's go on. And we were talking and, and he said, you know, I've heard people say, well, you can't be perfect. And he said, I've always, I thought, well, why not? I am. I thought, well, <laughs> okay. I am too in Christ. The Bible says we're perfect in Christ. But that's not what he was talking about. He was talking about according to the law, not according to grace and mercy and the provision in Christ, but according to the law that he was perfect. I guess he thought that he was. But you see, that's, again, that is not humble. And Isaiah 66 says, to this one will I look, the one who is humble and contrite in heart and who trembles at my work. So here in Jude chapter 3 again, Jude is saying, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, that's what he wanted to talk about. And that's what we want to talk about. 
We don't want to have to talk about the Sabbath. We don't want to have to talk about the holy days. We don't want to have to talk about Christmas or Easter and the pagan roots thereof. We don't want to have to talk about those things. And Jude didn't either. We don't want to talk about false teachers. We don't want to. But it says, beloved, I was trying to write a letter about our common salvation. I wanted to. I was striving to. But he's saying the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me. He said, I want it. I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all handed down to the saints. So this is the original faith, the apostolic faith, and that's what we strive for, the original apostolic faith. But he said, that's what I wanted. And he says, contend for that faith. For, and here's the reason why. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. In other words, there were wolves, there were, there were wolves, but they were in sheep's clothing. Now, most of the time, wolves don't know they're wolves. I mean, they think that people can talk themselves into. Like, well, the Sabbath doesn't matter. And if we, if we start teaching the Sabbath, we become legalistic. You know, that's the way. Uh, we don't want to become legalistic. And we can't be telling everybody all these things. That doesn't really matter anyway. What matters is what's in our heart. What matters is what is in my heart. That's what you hear all the time. Well, what matters is in your heart, but the problem is, is that what's in your heart is manifested in what you do and what you practice. Amen? Isn't that right? I mean, David, who do we know in the Bible that had a heart for God? Who do we know in the Bible where God himself says, this man is a man after my own heart? I mean... He is after my own heart. I love this man. He was talking about David. And what do you read in Psalms, David's Psalms, that he sang about? Oh, how love I the Lord, it is ever with me. He said, I meditate on it day and night. I love your law. It teaches me. It teaches me about you and about your character and what you care about. David knew he fell short. He said that. I mean, he, he asked for forgiveness all the time. Psalm 51, he said, against you only have I sinned, O God. I sinned against you. Please, uh, you know, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit in me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. That's what he was saying. So, we have an example of a man who really did have a heart for God. And he loved God's commandments. He loved them. But he recognized that he fell short of them. And he asked forgiveness and he asked for mercy. And he depended upon the grace of God. Amen. But he loved God's law. It wasn't either or. How? Why would it be either or? Listen. People that say, oh, well, you don't have to keep those commandments. Those commandments don't wait. You know what? Those very people have their own commandments. They do. Oh, yeah. Let me, let me say, we can learn a lot about how God views things by the life of Jesus. Because what he emphasized and what seemed to matter more to Jesus was not the same that mattered to the religious leaders. The religious leaders were much more about the letter. You know, when they brought the woman that was called an adultery before Jesus and they said, the law of Moses said she is to be stoned. That's true. Jesus didn't dispute that at all. That's what, that's what the penalty was. But Jesus also knew that there was not one person there accusing her that wasn't a sinner himself. 
Now, she had committed the uh, sin of the flesh. Many of them were committing a very, very serious sin of the spirit. Self-righteousness. Judging others without judging themselves. Being lifted up in pride. You know, being ready to... But, again, you could see that that's what the requirement was. But Jesus simply just... He didn't say, well, you're wrong. He didn't say she's okay. <laughs> it's all right what she did. He, he didn't, she wasn't saying that. He wasn't saying that. But he was just saying, okay, then if you're going to stone her, let's begin with the one who is without sin. The one who doesn't, the one who doesn't have any sin. The one who is, is worthy to cast that first stone. You, you begin. And you know, they just all walked away. And then he turned to the woman and he said, where are those who condemn you? And she said, well, they're gone. He said, I don't condemn you either, but go and sin no more. Now see, this is radical. This is, this is that, doesn't, that didn't happen. It was a done deal. This woman was called an adulterer. We're gonna, everybody stone her. And that was a judgment. And it was a righteous judgment. But see, these people were, uh, they were setting themselves up above. This, you know, they were wearing their tassels. They were acting like they were righteous. And they were as guilty, even of even a greater sin. They were living in a state of self-righteousness. She committed an act that she may not ever commit again. For all we know, she may have already been convicted. For all we know, she'd been convicted and said, I'm never going to do that again. We don't know any of that. The Lord knows. But those people were staying in a constant state of self-righteous, self-righteousness, see. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for the condemnation, for this condemnation, Ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and who deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. And then verse 17, it says, But you, brethren, it talks about these false teachers. Well, verse 16, it says, They are grumblers. They're finding fault. They're following after their own lust. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But he says, Now, you, brethren... You beloved, you ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you, in the last time they will be mockers and they will follow after their own ungodly lusts. These are ones who cause division because they're worldly minded. They're devoid of the spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God and wait anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. You see, they didn't have any kind of mercy. They didn't have any mercy on her. They were using her in order to try to trap Jesus. And they didn't care if they killed her. Well, where was the man? They didn't bring him, you know. But when they brought that woman, I mean, they... they they were just trying to trap Jesus. What do you say? The law of Moses says that she used to be stoned. So what do you say? And they thought they had him caught. And he didn't answer them because the Bible says, answer a fool according to his folly and don't answer a fool according to his folly, whichever applies. In that case, they were foolish and they were in their folly and he wasn't going to answer them, but they kept on. And of course, he began to write in the dirt we don't know what that was. Could have been sins that those people were committing. Oh, that's my name and there's a sin beside it. I think I'll just slip on out. I don't know. I kind of like to think it was that way. But they were all, you know, just like indignant. This woman, how dare her commit adultery. Bring disgrace to Israel and to God. And, I, and they're standing there, you know, in total self-righteousness. And Jesus knew what sins they had, that maybe that they were hiding. Amen.
Jude verse um, 22, have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear. Have mercy with fear. Hating even the garment polluted by flesh. You know, I don't know how many times, you know, we'd have someone that would, maybe they, you know, would get enticed by the world and they'd leave the congregation and go to the world. And when they would, um, then they would speak evil of people here, usually, and me as a pastor. That just happens. That's just the way it is. It's a way of making, justifying themselves, you know. Well, this is a reason. And, um, but again, there's quite a few would eventually come back, you know. And, you know, you, you just want to have mercy. You just want to be happy they're back. You don't want to address anything they did, you know. I mean, if they repent it, I don't want them to have to, you know what I mean? Now, there was a time years ago, I'd want them to come up here and address the congregation. But as I got older and softer, <laughs> a little bit more tender-hearted, I didn't want to put that on them. I thought, well, that's between them and God. You know, I don't want to make them come up here in front of the congregation and face everybody and have to apologize and all that kind of stuff. I don't know which is better. All I know is how, how I felt like doing it at the time after praying about it. And, uh, but you know, nowadays you just want to have mercy. That's all. You just want to be merciful. You just want to be happy. You know, I mean, I remember the last uh, young woman that had been gone for years, went out to the world and spoke evil of a lot of people here. Uh, but then eventually, you know, she was convicted and she wanted to come home. Well, I met her out there. I was there when she drove up out in the parking lot. I didn't say anything. I just hold her, held her, hugged her, you know. That's all I cared about. And she was used to the way it used to be way back because she was raised in the church, you know. And she was thinking, you know, you know she was just trying to tell me, you know, how sorry she was for this and that and that. And I said, just don't even talk. You know, I don't, I don't even want to care about it. And I think that's how the Lord is to us in a lot of ways. I mean, we can confess our sins, but then he forgets it. Amen. He forgets it. He remembers our lawless deeds no more. And I love that scripture there in Hebrews chapter 8. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 12. This is the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. That's what he's saying. So, you know, everything that, that you know, that you were taught in the law of Moses, God's law, and everything that the prophets, you know, the prophets would come with the word of God. It comes down to love one another as you love yourself and treat one another as you would want to be treated. Now, I don't know anyone that doesn't want to have mercy extended to them. They want to have mercy extended to them. See, we have to be tender. We have to be tender hearted to people. Well, hold God's standard. God holds his standard, of course, but he's tender-hearted. Amen? How many times has, has God had mercy? He had mercy on Nineveh, one of the most wicked cities ever in history. You know, if it was a TV show, they'd be the Klingons. You know, I mean, that was awful. If you don't know the Klingons, that's Star Trek. So in everything, therefore... Treat people the same way you want them to treat you. This is the law and the prophets. It's commonly called the golden rule. Enter through the narrow gate. The gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. 
For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. That's a very sobering scripture. Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Now, they're, you know, they're not trying to. But listen. Think about the Saturnalia. Okay, the winter solstice festival. They clothe it in sheep's clothing. Right? Well, we're not going to call it the Saturnalia. We're not going to call it the winter solstice, the 12 days, you know, of the winter solstice. We're going to call it, we're going to put the name of Jesus on it. We'll put Christ, Christ's Mass, the Mass of Christ. That's what we're going to put on it. You see, that's like a wolf in sheep's clothing. That's putting something to make it look like it's harmless or make it look like it's of God when it's not. Because beware false prophets, verse 15, who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. They will devour you. Now, it, I, like I say, I think most wolves don't know they're wolves. Or they're just, that's their nature. They don't think about what even, what a wolf is. It's just a wolf. Wolves are highly social. Very social. And wolves has a, you know, the wolf pack has a hierarchical rank, you know. It's led by the alpha female, uh, male and alpha female. They decide if any other wolves mate in the pack. They can allow it, but everybody has to be, it has to be, you know, allowed by the alpha male and alpha female. They run it. Everything goes, you see, everything in that pack, every other wolf in that pack, all the way down to the omega wolf. You start with the alpha, that's Greek for first, the number one. And omega is Greek for the last, last letter of the alphabet. I mean, first letter a alphabet and the last. And so you have the alpha, the top, male and female, and you have the omega, which is like the comic relief of the pack. Submissive to everybody. Always just like, okay, I'm, I'm submissive. And then you have everything in between. But it's all controlled by the, the two. They control everything else that goes on. And everyone else is uh, subordinate to the... And you see, this, this is how a pack works. A pack of wolves are led by two alpha wolves that decide everything for everybody else. Sheep are completely different. Sheep are dependent upon a shepherd to lead them and protect them. You see, they don't lead themselves. They're dependent upon a shepherd to lead them and to protect them. And who are they protecting them from? The pack. Who are led by the top two alphas. And so every pack, and they're not all the same. It depends upon the two alphas. They're going to decide what everybody else can do and can't do. Whether they can mate or not mate, they could permit it or not. It's just totally up to each individual pack, and that's up to the two alphas there. Well, I'm saying this is because Jesus says that's who the false teachers are. That's the ones who are against us. Those, those are the ones who are after the sheep. Those are the ones who are trying to poison us. Those are the ones who are trying to te bring in poison, damnable heresies. They're the ones. They're the ones that are trying to discredit you, uh, to attack you, to bring you down, you see. And so you have to think about they're not alone. It's not an individual 
You might, you, you might be attacked by somebody who says, well, why is that person attacking me? It's because they're under the leadership of an alpha male and female somewhere. See what I mean? If they're acting like a wolf, that's what's happening. <clears throat> they may not be the alpha or the... They may even be the omega. They may attack you through comic relief or something. But you're still going to be attacked, though. So it says, beware of false prophets, because they will come to you how? In sheep's clothing. In other words, they'll look like you. But inwardly, they're ravenous wolves. Now, they don't know it. You know, I'm, Acts chapter 20, you know, when Paul met with the Ephesus elders, he told them he, they were weeping. Oh, they were just crying on each other. And Paul said he hated to, but Paul was also a prophet. And he said, after I depart, ravenous wolves are going to come in. And they're not going to spare the flock. Protect the flock whom the Lord has allotted to your care, who has put you as overseers of them. You protect them. And, and he said, weeping, he said, even among your own selves, some of you are going to rise up and you're going to start bearing bad fruit. He said, you're going to begin to speak perverse things and lead the sheep astray. Speaking perverse things, things that are not true, watering down the truth. And that's what we always have to watch for, is when someone wants to water down the truth, and they'll tell you that something doesn't matter, you see. Or they'll just come out with a straight lie saying something, you should do this, when the Bible says not to. The Bible says to do it a different way, or on a different day, like we're here on the seventh day. <clears throat> So he says, so every good tree bears good fruit. And of course, this is for the nourishment. This is teaching. So every good tree bears good fruit. In other words, if it's, a, if it's a, not a false teacher, not a false prophet, he's not going to bear, he's going he's to bear good fruit, good teaching, sound teaching. They can be proven by the Bible. You will know them. By their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So that's like saying you're not going to gather the full truth <clears throat> from a false teacher. You see, he's going to present something else. He's going to say something like, well, I know Christmas is not really Jesus' birthday. And I know the, <clears throat> the customs come from paganism. I understand that. But that's not why we do it. And I've always said, well, why are you doing it? I had a, a neighbor who was a retired Assembly of God pastor, <clears throat> and I loved the man. And I don't know how it escaped him that, that you know, that, and he didn't know that I didn't observe Christmas. But it, he brought a Christmas tree over to my house one day, drug it up on my porch. <laughs> and uh, he said, I brought you this Christmas tree. And I said, well, brother, I don't, I don't want to offend you. But I said, I haven't kept Christmas since I was like, 19 years old, you know? And uh, I don't observe it. I, th I think it's wrong to observe it. He said, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. I said, well, it's okay. You didn't mean anything. You were just trying to give me something. But I said, can I ask you something? And he said, yeah. And I said, what do you think about? <laughs> What's in your mind? <laughs> when you're worshiping Jesus, <clears throat> to think, I know what I'll do. <clears throat> I'm going to bring a tree to my house. I'm going to prop it up in a prominent place. I'm going to decorate it with silver and gold. <clears throat> I'm going to put some purple or red around the bottom of it. And then I'm going to lay gifts at his feet. I'm just asking. <laughs> what are you thinking? What, how is that worshiping Jesus, you know? And he, he just never thought of it because it's just like, why well, he grew up doing that just like I did. You know, didn't think anything about it. 
But anyway, he didn't have a, a course answer, and he didn't really want to talk about it anyway, and I didn't press him. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he will enter. And many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out many demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will say, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, who you who practice lawlessness. Now, think about that and place that with with 1 John chapter 2, where John says, if someone comes says, you know, I've come to know the Lord, but does not keep his commandments, he is a liar. That doesn't mean he's trying to lie, but he is a liar and the truth is not in him. That's what he says. So again, he's connecting here, you know, knowing him with obeying him and not knowing him by lawlessness. Yeah, I was talking earlier, because um, I'm going to wrap this up here in a minute, but um, I was talking earlier about chapter 6 of John, where Jesus fed the 5,000 plus. Amen. And <clears throat> then he walks on water. And he has Peter walk on water. And we talked about that earlier. And then we get to chapter 7. And we find in chapter 7, the beginning of chapter 7, his own brothers, Jude and James, those are the two we know. He probably had other brothers too, but we know of them because they became prominent ministers, you know. James, who wrote the book of James, and Jude, who we just read, were his actual brothers, half-brothers, you know, whose mother was Mary. <clears throat> but they didn't believe in Jesus, you know, um, that he was anything special, that he, you know. And so in chapter 7, they're saying, well, we're going up to the Feast of Tabernacles. Why don't you go up and why don't you do, do your miracles and everything? And, you know, and just show yourself to who you really are. And they're just being sarcastic. And Jesus <clears throat> said, well, I'm not going up right now. But he did go up secretly later. And so the people were talking about him. And of course, this time they're, they're conspiring against him, the religious leaders. And... <clears throat> As I mentioned, here are people who just knew he fed thousands of people with two fish and five loaves of bread and had lots left over. He walked on water and he commanded Peter to walk on water and he could as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. Now he comes up to the feast and because of the religious leaders, people were afraid to even say anything good about Jesus. So the ones that were talking were the ones that were saying, I think he's a false teacher, you know. And why did they think that? Well, you know, I heard about that man at the Pool of Siloam. Never mind that he healed him. He hadn't walked in most all of his life, but he told him to carry that blanket home. He told him to break the Sabbath. And not only that, his disciples didn't wash their hands before they ate. And you know that's your tradition of the elders. You got to have that ceremonial, you know, cleansing. And also, somebody told them, I think, you know, Rudolph, the Pharisee. Don't look him up because he's not in the Bible. Rudolph, the Pharisee. He told me that he was there and he saw Jesus' disciples walking through the corners of the fields and they were harvesting grain and eating that grain, you see. Not only that, he let a prostitute wash his feet. Yeah, and anoint him with perfume in Simon's, the great Pharisee's house. 
He didn't send her away or scorn her or anything. He just let her do it. And he was hanging out with Zacchaeus, that infamous tax collector who cheats the people. And other prostitutes and other tax collectors. What? This guy can't be from God. Can he, know, can he not see that they're unclean? You'll never see Rudolph, the great Pharisee, you know, hanging out with these people. You won't, and then some of the things he says. I mean, he's, he called the religious leaders like a brood of snakes and stuff like that. I mean, I don't know. This is, you know, this is. And then I also, do you know what happened to Samaria? He went to Samaria. Not just Samaria, he met a Samaritan woman. Not just met a Samaritan woman, he met her alone in the middle of the day at a well. Not just that, he sent his disciples somewhere else so he could be alone with her. Something's up with that. Hmm. I don't think we can trust this guy. Well, yeah, but I hate to say this, but he walked on water. He told the wind to stop. He told the sea to come. He healed a man that couldn't walk. I heard he brought someone named Lazarus back from the dead. He'd been dead in the tomb for four days. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And he just came out. He said, unwrapped him. He hadn't even decayed. God, this guy just healed him. I don't know. Maybe I'll listen to him. Ah. Uh, uh, Oh, our, our leaders are saying he's breaking the law. It can't be, can't be right. Yeah. <clears throat> and they thought all these things because that's what they had been taught. So I think we will conclude back over to Jude. But you know, again, chapter 6 of John, we're going to conclude with the last part of Jude. We've already read it once, but I think it's a good, good script passage to, to conclude with. Again, John chapter 6, for this reference, I mean, this is what happens. People get, they're, in, they're uh, you know, poisoned by false teaching, and they judge everything by the false teaching. It's like what I was talking about here, uh, you know, a few weeks back, wrong thinking. We can have wrong thinking, you know, and not think like Jesus, you know. Now, Jesus was not contrary to the law. He said in Matthew chapter 5, never imagine I've come to destroy the law of the prophets. I've not. And not one comma will pass till, he you know, till heaven and earth pass away. So he wasn't against it. Of course not. He taught, he magnified the commandments. He said, not only is it wrong for you to murder, it's wrong for you to have hatred in your heart. If you have hatred in your heart, you've committed murder already, you see. So he magnified the law. Now, he did do away with some of the laws of, of Moses. Before he clarified, he said, don't, that, don't speak any vows. He said that, you know, in chapter 6 of Matthew. I love your enemy. You know, where the law said to be committed to the destruction of your enemy. So he, he said some things that, you know, that were contrary to some of the laws that were added because of transgressions. But um, he was not at all, uh, of course, against God's law. But here he is. He wasn't teaching against that, but he, he walked on water. He fed the thousands with the fish and the loaves of bread. Then he gets to the feast at Jerusalem and People are thinking, well, he's really a false prophet. His own brothers, you know, mock him. And then, you know, that's where it really begins. The pressure comes on, you know. And you find out that there's some people that have uh, Jews who believed in him. And he said to them, if you continue, uh, you will be set free. You will know the truth and truth will set you free. It offended them. You know, the gospel message is God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That he gave his own son on Calvary to pay for our sins. 
And that not just that, but not only has he washed us of our sins, he has destroyed the sinner in us. The body of death is crucified with Christ, as we see in Romans chapter 6 and 7. So he's dealt with that. So here we find he gets to, they're offended that he says that they were, would be set free. They said, well, we've never been slaves. But it seemed like you were slaves in Egypt. But. And then slaves to the Babylonians, slaves to the Medo-Persians, slaves to the Greeks, and now you're slaves to the Romans. But they had the audacity to say, well, we've never been slaves to anybody. And it got to the point to where they actually, those who were following Jesus, just because he said that, the truth will set you free if you continue to follow my teaching. They were offended. And it escalated. And Jesus tried to fix it. He said, I, you know, he tried to fix it, tried to clarify it. They wouldn't hear it. Chapter 7 and 8 continues on. And it got to the point where they actually said, you have a demon. That's what they said to Jesus. And Jesus finally got these same people that just in the same conversation minutes earlier, now Jesus said, you are of your father, the devil. Now just earlier, they were his followers. And that's how it changed. Because they were offended. And you know, that's what, you know what offends people? If you go to people and with the gospel message. The first thing that they have to receive is that they're in need of it, that they're a sinner, amen? That, that we need something to be, we, are, we, we need cleansing, right? I mean, we're, we're sinner, we fall short. We need to be cleansed. Somehow, people, they're offended by that, you know? And that they can't really receive, they want to think of themselves as already a good person, you know? And so if you think of yourself as really a good person, you don't see the value or the need of the sacrifice of Christ and of his mercy and his grace. So here we'll conclude. Um, and uh, let's see. Megan, would you mind coming up and close us in prayer afterwards and ask the blessing on the meal? Uh, verse um, 17 of Jude. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. That they were saying to you in the last time there will be markers. They'll follow their own ungodly lusts. They're worldly minded, minded, they'll cause divisions, they're devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Amen.